for that, uh, Rebecca. Here we go, Hugh. Another day where we seem to have uh, some positive movement on these equity boards. You must hate that. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm yoga calm. <laughs> the, my expectation is that, um, that you know, markets don't fall in, in, these, in these summer months here. Yeah? Um, yeah. And I still think there's one last big, big jolly hurrah out there. Yeah. thousand on the S&P maybe. You know, so why not? Uh, so it's a suck in. It's a suck in rally. Uh, um, and it, uh, it's just going to uh, deliver maximum punishment to those who don't see the truth. Well, these are, they're, they're, they're all emotionally loaded uh, terms. All I'm saying is that equities seem to have as an asset class that you could lose 50%, you could maybe make 100 How much, given that disparity of returns, would you allocate if yeah. you were like just sitting there with, with all of your precious capital? For me, and, and having seen the market rally, I wouldn't allocate that much to it just now. I'm, I'm not trying to catch that last 10%. Yeah. I think there's a, like maybe a 10% in it, and I'm not willing to stretch to expose myself to the other side. Um, I understand why other people are. That's their business. Let them do it. As I say, my flower is in winter, and I think in winter I have more misgivings that actually, whilst we see this fiscal stimulus, <laughs> that the private sector is still contracting, debt is still contracting as public debt um, expands. I think they cancel each other out. You know. What what uh, what trades do you have on at the moment? Uh, I mean, look, we know that this can change in a nanosecond, and what you may say today may be very different uh, tomorrow yeah, or yeah. in two days' time. But for the record, um, yeah. do you have any positions right now? Uh, yeah, that I mean, have of course. I, I mean, um, we we have huge intellectual conviction, and the, the danger is that you over you, you force that into your portfolio. Our our intellectual conviction, of course, is one that you know that this is a more profound. Um, downturn that we're experiencing and that markets will come under pressure again. Okay, My favourite asset class remains long duration conventional government bonds, deflationary trades. Um, I have them in my portfolio but I don't have a lot of them in my portfolio and it's my hope an ambition that I can actually step up to the plate yeah. and buy a lot more of these as we get to the end of August and go into September. David writes in from uh, Beverly Hills and he says, um, how does he reconcile his bullishness on the bonds with the financing needs of government? Um, it's the bogeyman, you know, it's like being a child and being scared of shadows. The, the, this funding thing is just, just bunkum. I mean, heavens, we've got 20 years of the Japanese demonstrating that it's not an issue. Japanese public debt to GDP was the same as it was in the UK two years ago. It was 40% of GDP. Today, it's almost 200%. They've issued trillions of, of, of yen of this paper. i give you another example. In 1996, the US financial system was issuing half a trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities. In 2003, they were issuing three trillion dollars. Can you imagine if we were issuing three trillion dollars of treasury this year? People would have a heart attack. Yet they sold them. You, you always, you always sell them. Um, the, the paradox is that people get more concerned about government and about government debt. And again, it kind of sows the seeds of its own destruction because this fear, this bogeyman fear of issuance has pushed the 10-year to almost 4, the 30-year to almost 5% yields. And any further on that, and what you're finding is, finding rather, is that mortgage rates in America now are higher today than they were as we entered this year. And so we've actually dampened, we're actually T tightening the screw, we're making monetary policy tighter and tighter. And as I say to you, as we get later on the year, I think that tightening in monetary policy could have a regressive impact on company earnings and on the performance of the stock market. Uh, Martin writes in and asks about the, uh, the China story and how much weight you'd put in, in China uh, really bearing the recovery. Um, well, um, I believe that China and the other surplus nations, a bit like here we are talking about you know, Madoff. Mm -hmm. um, if Madoff had been responsible for US GDP accounting, he would have overstated the size of the American economy. Uh, now, we didn't have Bernie, but we had debt. And I believe that the presence of all of this debt in America overstated the size of its economy. And my fear is that China, Japan, Germany, Korea, I think they've built capacity, industrial capacity, to service a world which doesn't exist. So my fear with China, to answer your question, is that it owns 100% of the world's surplus capacity. And so what it represents is a deep out-of-the-money call option on American GDP, right? So people become a little bit more bullish in the last three months. China's gone up a lot, but I'm not bullish on the progress of American GDP. I think nominal US GDP could 
grow at 1% for the next 10 years. Now, if that's the case, the last place you want to be is the surplus countries. Pete writes in uh, from Seattle and says, um, OK, we accept the view hyperinflation is not going to happen. But if that is the case, what is the road back for a world economy trapped in a deflationary cycle, which it sounds as, uh, as though you're describing when you talk about that continuous decline in prices? Yeah. Um, <coughs> well, th that is a world where we have to get used to um, a, a decline in living standards. That is a world we have to get used to less speculation as a means of creating wealth. You don't create wealth. It's not healthy when all of us are creating wealth through the, the fountain of speculation. We have to get back to a world of, of making things, of savings. We have to get a world of, get back to a world of trying to put this government monster back into you know back into its bottle. You know, the front page of some of the, the European newspapers today, they have you know green protest groups um, lobbying, indeed suing the British government for its involvement in the banking sector and saying that now loans have to be made on on ethical green standards. That's the road to ruin on on. On my, um, on, on my opinion. So um, my, my true answer, however, is I think ultimately uh, with fiat currencies and democracy that um, deflation doesn't happen. I'm just saying to you that I think this paranoia today that inflation is happening today and as we push interest rates up, I think it puts in step a motion for, again, a regression in the economy. And at some point, when it looks again as horrid as it did in October last year, then they get the authority and the legitimacy to step up and truly print money. I think they're not printing enough money, which is a radical proposition, I know, and I apologize for it being so kind of out of the box. But I don't think they're printing enough with regard to the wealth destruction which has happened in the last 18 months. And I think they're being cautioned by you know, Angela Merkel. The, the German Chancellor saying, this is outrageous. You know, I think they're being cautioned by the Chinese governor, again making the same comment. I think they're being cautioned by gold being at $1,000 and by fears about the dollar. So I think, I think Bernanke gets it, but I think he's been cautioned to take baby steps as he reads Mark Faber saying, the US is the next Zimbabwe. Yeah, and I think history, wouldn't it be ironic if history says, Bernanke got it, but Warren Buffett didn't get it, that he was right to worry about deflation. They should have done more. Instead, they were cautioned by all of us and that we raised interest rates and, and actually we killed the golden goose. Yeah. Um, more with you, Hendry. Uh, let's get back to Becky, though. Let's get an update on what's happening on the current market.